G'day everyone, sorry for the interruption, we'll be back to the video in a second. Just wanted to say if you're watching this because you're working from home or perhaps you're on lockdown at home and stuck there and you're looking for tech content, hopefully you enjoy this and hopefully you use this time to improve upon your own tech skills. But most importantly, stay safe, stay healthy and be mindful and respectful of, of the needs of others in this time. Anyway, on to the video. Row ID. Most people know what a row ID is, but here is a question that came in to me. I see blog posts about the row ID. Sometimes it's just a random string. Other times it seems to be a sequence of hex numbers. Are they the same thing? Can you please explain? The row ID is one of those things that has uh, its part and parcel of our understanding of the database structures, but it has actually has undergone some changes over time. Let's talk about the row ID and why it might be a series of random strings or it could be some hex numbers. We're going to take a little trip down memory lane. Once again, thanks to a friend of mine, Patrick, who uh, supplied this. What do I mean by a trip down memory lane? Take a look at this gem. This is a virtual machine running under Oracle VirtualBox. And you may not recognize what that operating system looks like. That is Windows NT version 3, one of Microsoft's first server platforms. Now, why VM with the Windows server of that age? This is 20 plus years old. Because you can see there in the middle, there's an Oracle installation on this. And in fact, uh, before we jump into role IDs, I thought I'd show you some of the cool things that how Oracle used to be back in the day. So uh, this is Oracle 7. And when you used to run Oracle 7, you would get things like this, which is, it's going to continue without a repository. This is the uh, predecessor to things like Enterprise Manager. So you can check what sessions you have, in doubt transactions. That was about it. You can check your init.org parameters. And there we go. That's uh, Instance Manager. You could have this one, which is Schema Manager, which looks a bit like the uh, object browser in SQL Developer. You have tables. You could expand. Yeah, there's this Scott Schema, et cetera. It's all running under Windows. And we walk along. This is the SQL worksheet. This was going to be the successor to SQL Plus, but it never really took off, but you can run queries in there, for example. Can't remember how you actually run something. Maybe it's down here. There we go. There we go. And then you get the output on top as opposed to below. Once again, a, a fraud run to SQL Developer. Let's not save those changes. We had the storage manager, so you could manage your table spaces and the like. And you had this one, which is the backup manager. So you could actually take backups of your table spaces and the like. This is security manager, which I think is, yeah, if you want to create users and change their passwords, etc. It's a uh, memories of a beautiful time. So that's the administrator toolbar. But to talk about role IDs, I'll fire up SQL Plus. And as you can see, SQL Plus hasn't changed. It's looked the same. The features in SQL Plus have changed over the years, but the look is pretty much the same. And you can see that we're on Oracle 7, 732. I hope you're not running Oracle 7 in production because it's just a little tiny bit out of support. So yeah, so if you're running Oracle 7.3, Time to upgrade. But let's have a look at the row ID from the employee table. This is how row IDs used to look. And in Oracle 7, they had this common structure. You can see it's sort of three pairs of strings. You don't see that in a modern version of the database. You see something quite different. This is why I was very keen to show you this, that for sure I wasn't lying to you, that this is actually how row IDs used to look. Let's explore that a little bit further. We'll come back to our VM. To discuss how our ID is formatted, we need to understand how the database is structured. And anything that consumes space in the database is called a segment. Those segments are built up of extents, chunks of data, contiguous data on disk that actually get allocated as the segment grows. You create a table, it occupies no space. You start putting rows in, you get the first extent. When that extent is full, you get the next extent, etc. Each extent is made up of database blocks. This I actually got from the Oracle 7 manual, this little screenshot, just to show how things have changed. And in those days, the default block size that a lot of people used was a 2K block size. Most of us have known now that 8K is pretty much the way to go. But the concept is the same. Segments consist of extents, which consist of blocks. Now, those segments and those extents exist in files. Everything that sits on a server ultimately sits in some sort of file. It may be a physical file on disk like you see here, but it could be something in ASM, could be a raw device, but ultimately it's some 
big, large allocation of space on disks somewhere. As tables grow, they allocate extents and those extents get allocated in one or more files. So to know where a particular block or row in a table is in the database, you obviously need to know the file it's in. You then need to know what extent it's in. And really, the extent is a logical concept because an extent sits in a position in a file. So you really just need to know what offset from the start of the file that's in. So the block number. And then inside that block will be an 8K block or a 2K block, and then we'll have the rows inside that block. So we need the file number to decide what file it is. We need to know the block offset. How far into the file do I go in blocks? It could be in bytes, but blocks is useful for us because it's the unit of size in the Oracle database. And then inside that block, we need to know the row number. There might be 10 rows in a block. We might be interested in the ninth row. And that's effectively what we get when we look at the row ID way back in Oracle 7. We have three sets of numbers, which are indeed the file number, the block number, and the row number. In fact, we can actually, even without having this annotated, we can get some idea as what this probably is here. Given that the Oracle, the Scott.emp table is so small, we can see that it's probably the third set of digits there is probably the file. It's uh, C, or maybe the 12th file. The first set of digits is probably the block number. That would be the largest number we would have because we have to offset a large amount into a file. And the middle digit is most probably the row number because we have the zeroth row in a block, the first row, the second row, etc. And that's what we have. File number, block number, and then the row number. They are three attributes that make up a row ID. If you look at a row ID as it comes out on the screen like we saw in our VM, and you'll see this occasionally on blog posts as well, if we actually add up the bytes there, you can see we've got eight bytes, then four bytes, then four bytes, that would seem to suggest that the row ID is 16 bytes of information. This is not true. Or you might be thinking, well, they're hex strings. Normally with a hex, you have pairs of characters to identify a byte. So maybe you're thinking it's four bytes for the block number, two bytes for the row number, two bytes for the file number. Even that's actually not the case. It actually is six bytes. And we can actually prove that. If I go back to our old VM, our beautiful Oracle 7, Let's do a dump function. Oh, I have to a whole lot again. And we can see if we actually dump out the row ID from a table, the length is actually six bytes. Even though on screen it appears to be larger. Six bytes is what we need for a row ID. And the way we, it's been structured to occupy those six bytes, uh, the file is allowed to be up to 10 bits. 10 bits means you can have two to the power of 10, that's 1,024. The block is 22 bits long, which is 4 million, two to the power of 22, and the row is 16 bits. So based on that, the way the Oracle database works back in Oracle 7 is to identify a row, it must be in one of 1,024 files. In that file, it could be up to between one and four million blocks across in the offset. And then we have 16 bits for rows. So even then, back in those days, Oracle was allowing potentially 65,000 rows in a block, which is impressive. Not that we could actually ever achieve that with the block sizes we have. Given that we have 1,024 files, each one could be 4 million blocks with, let's assume an 8K block size. We throw that into a simple calculation. We can see that the theoretical maximum for an Oracle database back in Oracle 7 was 32 terabytes. That wasn't a big deal because back in Oracle 7 days, we ran Oracle 7 on servers like this. This is actually a Sun Enterprise 450. I worked with these when I first started working with Oracle 7. In those days, this was a fairly hefty box. It was a powerful box. The chassis there, you could hold 20 disks, 20 SCSI disks in those days, up to nine gigabytes each. We didn't talk in terms of terabytes in those days. 200 gigabytes, for example, was a big database way back in the Oracle 7 days. You would sort of hear of certain organizations you know, approaching the, the mythical terabyte mark. So having a ceiling of 32 terabytes was plenty back in Oracle 7. In Oracle 8, which came along at the end of the last millennium, or sort of the late 90s, we had a problem because the world was starting to get bigger. We were starting to accumulate more data. And so we wanted the database to actually scale to beyond 32 terabytes. But that introduces two problems. One is just because people are upgrading from seven to eight, doesn't mean, as Oracle, we really had the right to say, look, we want to change the way 
we address information on disk because 32 terabytes isn't enough. Is it okay if you unload and reload your entire database to do so? One of the prides that we take in Oracle is you've never ever had to unload and reload your database to do an upgrade. It's always just a dictionary upgrade. We need to be able to map to larger than 32 terabytes, but not change the row IDs we currently have. We don't want to have to consume more than six bytes for a row ID. The second problem is, as we saw before, when you query the row ID, it comes out looking like an 18 character string. In fact, if I go back to my DM, just scroll off a bit, you can see that's 18 characters across the screen, including the full stops. Once again, if you've got applications that are currently querying that value out and storing it, we don't want to then, if we're making a larger row ID in some way, to say, oh, by the way, go change all your applications now because that string we returned is no longer 18 bytes, it's going to be 24 or 32 or something. So we had, to, we had to tackle those two challenges. How do we keep the internal representation at six bytes, but still be able to address more? How do we keep the external representation at 18 bytes or less, such that people don't have to rewrite their apps? So let's tackle this one first, the six byte problem. We have currently 10 bits for the file the original row ID that looks like this. Ideally, we just like to make you know, perhaps that bigger. What we could do is, rather than have it being the file for the entire database, which caps us at 1,024 files across the board, the first made architectural change we made was, we will keep that 10 bits for files, but we will make it relative to the table space. So now, rather than having 1,024 files for the database, you can have 1,024 files for every single table space. And the cool thing with that is, is the existing row IDs we would have in Oracle 7 when we upgraded could be left untouched and we could just make an assumption about them. If we didn't see any table space information, then we know that it's a one-for-one -one mapping from the old style. So the first 1,024 data files in your database will be untouched. And then as you add more than that, we'll have them relative to the table space. In that way, we don't have to change any existing data, but we've introduced this new facility which says files are now relative to table spaces as opposed to the entire database. That's very, very cool, except along with Oracle 8.0 came a new piece of technology. One is partitioning and the other is transportable table space. Now transportable table space was the ability to let you unplug a table space from one database and plug it into another. If we were now gonna start embedding the table space information, so a numeric ID that represented the table space, into the row ID for new rows as they come into the database, then we've got a bit of a problem because when we plug that table space in somewhere else, we might have some conflicts. So rather than doing the table space in the row ID, we actually changed it. We said, let's store the object number for that particular object in the row ID. The object number can be used to map to the dictionary to tell me what the table space is, and therefore I can pick up that information. And now I don't have to have this physical thing called the table space ID stored in the row ID. I can just have the object ID. And this is what we did for Oracle 8. The Oracle 8 row ID can be larger than six bytes, but the joy is all the existing row IDs stay at six bytes and are implicit. They map to what they were before. We don't have to change anything. When you create new row IDs in Oracle, we have this. We actually have four pieces of information in there now. We have the file block and row as before, the file being relative to the table space. And the way we identify that table space is to store the object ID in the row ID as well. I'm being, making a bit of a simplification here. There is a discussion that we could have later about object ID and data object ID. They're two different attributes. Um, but for the time being, let's just keep it nice and simple. We now have four attributes stored on the row ID, file, block, and row as before, and the object ID. That brings us to now 10 bytes. 10 bytes for new row IDs as they get created in the database. The remaining row IDs that were existing there stay at six bytes and never need to be changed. That gets us onto the second problem. Originally, we were displaying three pieces of information, the file, the row, and the block in 18 bytes, that sort of three sets of digits we saw in the string when we bring it out to the outside world. It looks like this. Now, if I was just keep, to keep that model and just have that same sequence of hex digits, on a new row ID, which consists of four attributes, it would look something like that. Now that's obviously bigger than 18 bytes. It's gonna cause grief for customers. So the question is, how do we show four pieces of information in the space that we used to show three? 
the first thing we did, we ditched the dots. You know, they're just, they're just chewing up three precious pies that we'd rather have, so we ditched the dots. And the second thing is we changed the base. If you look at the examples we currently have, all the roll IDs come back as hex. How does hex work? If you want to show, for example, say 24 bits or three bytes of information in hex, you need six characters, two characters per byte. I chose 24 because if we change the base to say base 64, for 24 bits, you only need four characters, not six characters. What's base 64? We need the uppercase letters, that's 26. The lowercase letters, that's 52. The digits zero to nine, that gives me 62. How do I get the two remaining bits for base 64 representation? We throw a slash and a plus in there. And so there we have our 64 distinct characters to make up base 64 notation. So we can take our row ID that looked like this historically, convert that entirely to base 64, and it now looks something like that. Even if it has the object ID information in it, we can now compress it down to an existing 18 characters of display information for a 10 byte row ID because we're now using base 64 technology. So even those longer row IDs like that will still come out as a shrunken 18 byte string. This is very cool because now we have six byte row IDs left untouched, no issues with upgrade. New row IDs become 10 bytes, giving us greater addressability. We have 1,024 data files per table space. You're allowed to have 65,000 table spaces in an Oracle database. That gives us a ceiling of 2,048 petabytes in an Oracle database. So it's, what's that? That's two, is it exabytes after that? Hence the term exadata. But there you go. Once again, we had this transformational jump in the scale of what you can store in an Oracle database from Oracle 8 onwards. And that's why row IDs look sometimes like hex strings and sometimes like base 64 strings. It depends on how you want to display them and how they're stored and historically how we used to store them. So hopefully you found that interesting. If you want to dig into the components of a row ID, there is a database package supplied called DBMS underscore row ID. So if you are presented with a string old or new, you can convert between them and you can also dig out things like the object number, the file number, the block number. If you ever wanted to see whereabouts physically on disk a particular row or particular block was stored. Thank you.